Where our backyards meet the backwoods, some familiar figures have long made themselves at home. We as humans have created pretty much the perfect habitat for deer. White-tailed deer find the suburbs a safety zone. But how well do we know these backyard buddies? Sometimes they'll freeze and lock up for even two, three, four minutes. It's time to take a closer look at the private life of one of our closest neighbors. When filming, I'll see them stomp. They'll do that to get the attention of other deer, to alert them that something might be dangerous. New perspectives reveal a complex society. We saw a lot of antagonistic kind of behavior that we might have expected between males during the breeding season, but we also saw that kind of interaction among females as well. And a rare vision that roams North American woods. It stood for five seconds, maybe, eyed me, and took off and was gone. For three million years, they've roamed the woodlands. And we're still just trying to figure them out. The white-tailed deer. Believe it or not, we're right near a major road. But there's a big buck right over here, so um, I'm going to get my little outfit out and see if he'll put up with me. Cameraman Mark Emery has been filming whitetail for the past decade, tracking them through forests and meadows. He knows that familiar as they are, still the whitetail keep their distance. Every time Mark films them, he gets a first-hand glimpse of their jittery grace. You know, I've been coming in this area for about two weeks now, just sitting with these guys. And we sat here about 20, 30 minutes before they came up to eat grass right in here. And uh, as long as you make your movements very slow and take your time, they, uh, they'll stay around for a while. And if you do something a little goofy, boom, they'll take off. For Mark, it's a familiar pattern when man meets deer. The quick head jerk. the skittish movement, the gaze into the distance. All the senses are at work. Surprisingly, the deer aren't seeing much of anything at all. Nearly blind by human standards, deer have trouble seeing defined shapes. All they can really make out is movement. To compensate, they've developed their other senses. Their hearing is finely tuned. And their remarkable sense of smell can pick out odors hundreds of yards away. The nose of the white-tailed deer has nearly 300 million olfactory receptors, compared to just 5 million for humans. That's more than even the legendary bloodhound. And when a deer smells danger, it passes that information on, as Mark notices every time he gets too close. When filming, I'll see them stomp. They'll do that to get the attention of other deer to alert them that something might be dangerous. The white tail for which they are named is not just decorative. It's a key feature for communication. I've seen the tail come up slowly as though the deer is saying, I see something I don't really care for. And then you get this nervous twitching. When the tail goes up, it's a signal for all around. 
a white flag saying time to retreat. White-tailed deer may seem elusive, secretive, but there's a reason. They live on the boundaries, the borderlands, making a home for themselves in the places between worlds, the spaces between the wilderness and the man-made. It's the habitat known as the edge, where farms meet the forest and backyards meet the backwoods. Ironically, the human clearing that might harm other species or deprive them of living space works the exact opposite way for the adaptable deer. It allows them to succeed, even thrive. Some say they may be doing too well. Just a century ago, there were less than a million deer in North America. Today, there are nearly 30 million. No wonder it seems they're moving in right down the block. Nowhere are the deer more at home than next door in the suburbs. We as humans have created pretty much the perfect habitat for deer. These are areas that have a wide diversity of plants that deer can eat versus, say, a, a rural forest. One town that knows all too well about the deer, Cayuga Heights, New York. We know that in Cayuga Heights, um, in general, we have about 100 deer per square mile. What we need is far less than 100 per square mile, probably more like five per square mile. With no predators and unlimited food, this is the perfect home for animals that spend most of their lives in an area of just one square mile. That's why residents see the same deer family year after year. They walk through my yard and eat everything here. It's almost like watching them come into a buffet. I'll pull up into the driveway and I see eight to 10 deer. And they kind of look at me like, hey, welcome home. So there's some deer up here in the yard. And we're going to go try and get them on film. We gave cameras to a number of Cayuga homeowners over a three month period to capture the behaviors they see every day. The goal? To gain a new understanding of wild deer's actions in the suburban world. Well, good morning. <laughs> I think this one's a little timid. The first places the deer show up, anywhere there's something edible. What makes the whitetail such a challenge to backyard gardeners is they eat almost anything. Nearly 600 different species of plants grasses, acorns, fruits. In times of scarcity, they will consume twigs and bark, even poison ivy. Incredibly, they've also been spotted eating nestling songbirds. And very little deters them. We are in the backyard on the side. The fence is six feet high, and they have jumped over it, which amazed us. As you can see, we had to install this fence uh, to keep the deer out of our yard. This is a six-foot fence, which actually is somewhat inadequate. White-tailed deer will jump in the wild. They use this technique to evade predators and to just overcome an obstacle that's in their way. We had to build a really tall fence because deer were continuously jumping over it.
Deer can jump over an eight-foot obstacle. Sometimes from a running start, they can clear a bit more than that. It's no wonder a fence isn't much of a deterrent. The deer need to consume up to seven pounds of food a day. But these voracious eaters don't have upper front teeth. They chew by pressing their lower incisors against a pad on the upper gum. After these meals, the homeowners captured their first footage of the deer seemingly lazing the day away. Sunday morning and there's about four deer just bedded down in the backyard. To the Cayuga Heights cinematographers, it may seem like a siesta, but the deer are actually doing something crucial. They're digesting. Deer are members of the same ungulate family of hooved mammals as cows and buffalo. Like cows, they have a four-chambered stomach. They eat quickly. Then later, they cough up food and chew it again. It's a vital part of their eating cycle. And the reason they sometimes seem to hide during the day. Finding cover away from prying eyes, they disappear into the shadows to digest. But they're often a lot closer than you think. The crew decided to reveal the secret of this magic act by shooting a regular high-def camera side by side with one that picks up a thermal imprint. They were able to show where the deer go, a private world that's sometimes right under our noses. A thicket of branches is all it takes to make a deer invisible during the day. Only the slightest movement gives away the animal's position until it emerges again to feed. The hunt for food brings the whitetail into our lives and right alongside our roadways. But it's not a death wish that brings them here. This is another edge where they actually thrive. They can be along the side of the road for a number of reasons, but in general, it's about the growth along the edge of the road. What happens is you get more sunlight coming to that area. You'll see all these trees are pushing more branches out, competing for the sunlight along that edge, and you've got fresh growth and all kinds of things. So animals tend to cruise these edges looking for food or nutrition. Here along the roads, deer are walking a fine line, and that line can be deadly. In a suburban environment, deer have to cross roads all the time. Uh, deer vehicle collisions comprise most of the mortality in these areas. But evidence of a deer's adaptability is they get to learn cars and what motor vehicles mean. The older deer tend to cross these roads very uh, cautiously. Right now we're approaching some deer that are about to cross the road. It's early morning and they're out feeding. They're wanting to cross the road, but we have a school bus coming at the same time. Now the adult though is coming up to the road being very careful, pausing, looking both ways. The deer looked to the left, looked our way a bit, and is crossing slowly. The younger deer will likely cross right after her, and they'll just run out in the road. Fawns get into all sorts of trouble, just like uh, human kids. This is a fawn crossing the road, not looking. And there's another fawn crossing. 
because you saw the care that the adult doe took in crossing the road and how carelessly the younger deer crossed the road. Fawns and does alike. The survivors learn how to live on this dangerous boundary. On the borders of yards and roads, there are other edges deer inhabit. The edges of the day. Deer have natural rhythms throughout the day. And the period that they're most active is in the early morning or the late afternoon. And that's when they do a lot of their feeding. And this behavior is known as being crepuscular. Crepuscular, creatures of the shadows, of the dawn and the dusk. Whitetail are perfectly adapted for those hours. Their camouflage blends in. And it's the time their vision actually works best, attuned to the gathering darkness. But for the deer, this sensitivity to the twilight world has one built-in flaw, the famed deer in the headlights effect. Deer are interesting. They have extremely good night vision. And a part of, part of the reason for that is they have more rods than cones. And what rods do is they collect more light. Having more rods, they're um, able to see better in darker situations than humans can. But the downside to that is if you shine a light in their eyes, it doesn't harm them, but it makes it a lot harder for them to see. So that's why sometimes you get this deer in the headlights look. Surprisingly, fear has nothing to do with this well-known reaction. Too much stimulus overpowers their visual cortex. The entire brain locks down, and the deer can't do anything else. Sometimes they'll freeze and lock up for even two, three, four minutes. Right oh, there's a deer right there. So right now we've got this light shining on this buck here. You know, he's kind of trying to figure out what's going on. If you notice, it'll just kind of get a little confused and just stand staring kind of off in the distance while you have that light on him. And, uh, Sometimes, you know, in this situation, this, this deer didn't get too weirded out by it, but, you know, sometimes it can last for a couple minutes where they'll just stare into the light, kind of confused. From dusk to dawn, from season to season, in a life that spans just over a decade, the deer remain all around us. And at no time are they more visible than during the rut, the breeding season that begins each autumn. The rut marks a time when deer become less cautious and more active. So bucks, when they're normally very secretive, tend to be out and about and more visible. All through the woodlands, bucks begin signposting their presence. One of the signs uh, that the rut is occurring might be a buck rub. Whitetail bucks take their antlers or the glands on their forehead and they'll rub up and down a tree. They want to leave their scent as communication for other deer in the area. Deer have scent glands all over their bodies at least seven in all, from the bottoms of their feet to the inside of their back legs. 
with signals that range from come hither to danger, stay away. They can also vocalize with chuffs and calls to send warnings or indicate territory. And all these signals come into play during the rut. The rut is an interesting time of year. There's a very small window where these females or does come into heat. You have five days or six days where all these animals come into heat all at once. So these bucks are spending every waking hour trying to breed as many does as possible. Now the competition for mates begins. And the stags call on their antlers. Regrown from scratch every single year, this is the fastest growing tissue on Earth, expanding an inch every two days. Equipped with their very first antlers, Youngsters try a little tentative sparring. But for the adults, the rut is a time for full-on combat. There's a lot of aggressive behaviors, so bucks will do a lot of really neat things. They'll, they'll spar, they'll fight. It's a very fast and furious time, and it's a very exciting time to be in the woods. The battle has all the ritual steps of a duel. The slow approach. The challenge. And then... The clash. The winner claims his chance to sire the next generation. The loser hobbles off. Nowadays, the rut is not just the call of the wild. It's seen in parks and backyards. Cornell ecologist Bernd Blossie has found a buck on the prowl on the fairway of a local golf course. So we're in the middle of the rut, and I just spotted a buck here that is guarding a doe. Uh, what they typically do, they try to isolate a doe that's in the right uh, stage of the estrus cycle, and then they spend a significant amount of time with her, guarding her, fighting off any, any other bucks until she is ready to be bred. He's watching us, but I've seen him glance over to his left side too as if there's a doe that's still bedded down. So that's his prize right now. And he doesn't want to leave his prize alone. See how he's looking over to his left side? He's not ready to leave. So we can try to sneak around and see whether she's still there. He, he may be staring at her. There she is. She's is on, on the other side of the fence. You can just see her butt right now. See how he's watching her? She just ran away. He will try to go around and cut her off. And he will just use his nose to, to figure out where she is. Because there's such a small window of time when does come into heat, bucks want to be sure they don't miss their chance. During the rut, a buck will pick out the right-smelling female and then follow her wherever she goes. The buck is in lockstep with that female. You have a big buck out standing in the open. 
The does are being chased around all day long, and you can see deer activity all over the place. It's all about having offspring in the next generation, both for the does and the bucks, uh, what the ultimate evolutionary prize is having offspring that then contribute next year to the chases in the woods. While the clashes of the rut get so much attention, other interactions between deer remain more mysterious. Biologist Josh Milspa wanted to see those relationships in a brand new way. What we're doing is we're putting cameras on deer and we're monitoring what they see and what they hear real time. That's a completely different perspective than we've ever had. The footage that we got showed far more social interaction and sociability than we would have expected in deer. The cameras picked up a whole range of social signals. The deer sniff each other when they meet. A kind of handshake to determine age, sex, family group. They'll groom each other not just to remove parasites, but to maintain their bonds. And displays signal their status. Dominant deer walk with head held high. Subordinates keep their backs hunched and tails tucked. When things get tense, ears laid back along the neck represent the first challenge. But the cameras also found something startling. Conflicts between females escalate with surprising frequency. We saw a lot of antagonistic kind of behavior that we might have expected between males during the breeding season but we also saw that kind of interaction um, among females as well. It was just a lot more social interaction than we expected. The video provides an opportunity to lift the veil on deer to see the way that they interact in the wild, the way that they make a living in their environment in a way that we have never been able to see before. If Millspa is learning how deer interact with each other, our suburban observers back in Cayuga Heights have been using their cameras for nearly two months to gain insight into another aspect of deer behavior. The way deer handle the threats around them. This is McEwen, family dog, and coexists with the deer. Doesn't think they should be on his property, so he chases them just a little bit. And I'm hoping to videotape uh, the dog interacting with the deer. As the home footage shows, the whitetail are surprisingly canny. OK, McCune, go get him. Deer can learn and adapt to a suburban environment. They can get to know individual dogs and which ones are OK and which ones aren't. Over time, they might become habituated to the dog and become OK or not afraid. The deer stop and turn and look at him as if to say, OK, we're done with our chase for the day. As he only goes just to the edge of our property line, and then the deer seem to know. And another example might be deer not being afraid because they know the dog is on a leash and it can only go so far. So here's Trigger, and he needs to go out in the backyard. A lot of deer out there. He chases them. As you can see, this one didn't even move. The deer clearly grasp the limits of the danger. <laughs> Whitetail have learned that the suburbs seem to be a safety zone.
Ecologist Bernd Blossy wants to see how deer handle an unexpected threat. We're in the village of Cayuga Heights. We have plenty of deer activity in this area. And now we will see how they respond to a small pack of coyotes, in fact, three of them, that we will just set up here. We will see whether this works with the coyote cutout here. It's a good place to try it because it's a backyard that is being frequented by deer, and we should be able to capture some change in deer behavior. A trail cam is installed to track the deer's reactions. It's just a couple of hours after we left, and this big monster buck shows up, and he's eyeing the, eyeing the coyotes here. There's another deer coming right here, going right to the coyote. It's like two yards away, checking it out right here, lifting the, the oh, a little shy of it. You can kind of see here, this animal is cautious. Something is new in the yard. There are silhouettes there. Uh, they resemble probably something that the animal may have seen before, but these, these silhouettes don't behave like real animals. And they're not turning around, they're stationary. So now uh, the animal figured out this is a non-threatening situation. The deer are smart enough to learn what poses a real threat and what doesn't. This animal is completely checking out uh, what this thing is. Not scared behavior, definitely not. It's actually licking the coyote right now, so. <laughs> so it's very clear that they're adaptable. They encounter all kinds of different circumstances and they need to be able to respond to that. And that's what we're seeing here. Deer are always adapting, always responding to their environment. These changes can be physical, too. And nowhere is that seen more strikingly than on a few scattered islands in the Florida Keys. They're called key deer, the white tail in miniature. Key deer have been on the Florida Keys for the last 10,000 or so years. 10,000 years ago, the last glaciers melted and caused sea levels to rise. And in essence, they were trapped on this chain of islands. It's believed that they came from the mainland, Florida, though some also believe maybe they came from Cuba. The majority of them are found on two islands, Big Pine and No Name Key. Tiny worlds cut off from the outside islands push evolution to extremes. Larger animals tend to shrink over generations. In a world of limited resources, the only sensible solution is to get smaller. Here's a full-size adult female key deer. Shoulder height, they're, they're less than 36 inches. It's a very small deer. If this was a regular white-tailed deer, it'd probably be about this tall. Key deer are, are smaller than the average white-tailed deer because, in general, as you move from northern to southern environments, animals get smaller. It's a mechanism of dealing with the loss of heat. The males are, are slightly larger, but not much larger. So the average female is about 80 pounds. The average male is about 100 pounds. Because of, of their environment, they're, they're acclimated to humans, a really cute Cute animal, you can see why so many people love the key deer. People love them, but in a way, they're being killed by kindness. The more locals feed them, the more they're lured into neighborhoods where they're often hit by cars. Today, the key deer is endangered. In fact, there are less than 800 of them left. Yet still, they manage to hang on. One of the very few highly endangered animals that lives among people in the suburbs. What we're looking at is um, 
an adult male, key deer, and an adult female, and a baby, a newborn fawn here, family, yeah. um, endangered key deer. And uh, that looks like a new baby. She is tiny. Yeah. Look at I that I figure about four weeks old, about four weeks now. They're just so beautiful. When I first saw their size, I was shocked and amazed. I had never seen anything like it. I never get bored. <laughs> I never get used to it. I love them. I mean, it's just pure innocence. It really, I mean, good grief. I had a cat that was bigger than that. I mean, look how curious she is. They're so curious when they're small, too. So amazingly beautiful and gentle. The greatest trait I admire about the Keter population is the fact that they've, they're very resilient. And the Florida Keys, in fact, has changed dramatically in some cases in the last hundred years. And so being able to adapt to those changes and continue to survive is truly remarkable for this deer population. For the whitetail, one of the rarest variations of all is not size, but color. The legendary ghost deer. Photographer Jeff Richter has been tracking this mysterious presence in the northern woods for over a decade. I think in many respects that they're a ghost in both a physical sense and a mental sense. These deer are white because they do not have melanin uh, within their system. There's a recessive gene and it's relatively rare. In the human population, about one out of 20,000 people will be albino. Uh, same is about true with mammals. Well, you could spend an entire year or more and not see a white deer here. They are rare on the landscape, and unless you are lucky, uh, you might not see one. I still am as excited as the first day to see them. It still strikes me as a ghost in the, in the woods, a, a unique spirit, really. At this spot, it was one of the very first times I, I saw a white deer. Just looked out into the woods right here, and there was a, a doe standing there, just, just looking at me. It stood for five seconds, maybe, eyed me, and took off and was gone. Even though it's bright white, it was still gone. It was a magical moment. And that's pretty imprinted on my mind. I can still see that white deer standing right over there right now. Almost without exception, all the people I've talked to always remember where they were and where they saw their first albino deer. They just stick with people in a way that very few other animals do. We've spotted an albino here. I'm gonna see if I can get a little closer. Looks like she bedded down just in front of us. All of a sudden here you see this animal that's just pure white, pink nose. It doesn't really even look like a deer in a lot of respects. Oh, there she goes. Thank you, girl. There's something a little magic about it. Uh, it's hard to explain. One of the reasons we really love these white deer is that they 
live at this intersection of science and spirit. We have all this data and knowledge, behavioral understanding of deer. And then there's this mystery over here, this place of spirit that attracts us to the outdoors in the first place. And they all come together in that place called White Deer. The white deer may cast a certain spell, but all deer have their own special moment of magic. It happens each year, eight months after the rut, at the height of spring, when does give birth to their fawns. Amazingly, a female whitetail can become a mother by the time she's just nine months old. No other large mammal can reproduce so soon and an adult doe can give birth to singles, twins, or triplets. In the forests of Wisconsin, a group of scientists are in search of these newborns. They want to tag and study them, but the fawns aren't easy to track down. We've walked over fawns two and three times before we found them. People have almost stepped on them before they see them. For the first few weeks until they gain their strength and their speed, they hope that the predator or whatever danger will just pass them by. Fawns are great at hiding, and they have one secret trick. They are one of the very few creatures born with almost no scent. They give off practically no odor at all, so predators can't find them. But when they are found... There's a fawn over here. The fawns have almost no defenses. Give me the mask, give me the mask, give me the mask. Oh. Oh. Get those legs under him. They can't even count on their mothers to stand guard. White-tailed deer are not known for defending their fawns. If there is a disturbance, the, the doe will generally stay away. Bleating, that's the noise that they make. That's an alarm call. It's trying to get either the doe's attention or to warn any twin that may be in the area that something bad is happening. They rely on their hearing a lot more than they do their eyes, and we put the blindfold on them, but that doesn't mean that they still don't know what's going on. Their camouflage is really rather remarkable um, when they lay completely flat in litter like this. Um, if they were solid, this reddish brown color, it would be a lot easier to spot them. But with the light colors, it just helps break up their shape and mix in with sunlight to, to help camouflage them even more. Some of them fight you every bit of the way, and you have to really restrain them to get through your whole process. I tend to like it better that way, and it, it feels like their survival instinct is a little more developed. And so a new generation of deer is born into the forests. Many will make their way into our streets and neighborhoods and into our lives. It started one day in Tewksbury, New Jersey. I saw this bit of fluff lying in the tall grass. And as I got closer, I saw what I thought was a dead fawn. And in fact, uh, she probably would not have made it through the day. Here's a picture of the first day I found Blossom. My husband, Pino, was holding the ivy bag above her very limp, little, little body. Here's just a few days later. I'm cradling her in my arms, and so is uh, my husband. 
this little baby pretty much was dead. Whoop. And guess what? IV fluids and a little oxygen, TLC, and wham. This is now the third day. I knew something was special about this little animal. When she would start to want to play, want to interact. Come on! Her curiosity was so deep. Oh, gosh. We loved her, but she wasn't our pet. She was, in fact, a wild deer. And as she grew, she would disappear for days and days, but she always came back. <laughs> How you feel? Boy, where were you during that snowstorm? Here she is in the snow with her little herd behind her. There were one, two, three deer right behind her here. It was almost as if she had two herds or two families. Here's the sign I hung all over Tewksbury. The sign worked. Nobody hurt her. They only loved her. <laughs> oh, the little doll. Blossom. That's the way we used to say, Blossom. Hi, Blossom. What are you, good girl? Hi, Blossom. What you up to? I miss her. I miss everything I've been talking about. I, I miss the adventure. Blossom's here, in the kitchen. I miss what next thrill is around the corner. Hello, girl. Oh my God, look in the back. There's a big buck. Blossom was an ambassador to life. Ambassador to all that's good in nature. Present as the whitetails are around us, they are never domesticated, never truly tamed. For some of the suburban homeowners, after three months tracking the deer, their cameras revealed a truth long forgotten. Oh, there's one hiss at us. Even here in the suburbs, these are wild creatures. Filming the deer gave me a little bit more insight into what they're doing besides just eating the gardens that I created. I got to see them more as wild animals, and I like to be able to see that version of deer. <laughs> right outside the window, just beyond the door, they are a link back, a reminder of the wilderness that surrounds us still. I've often remarked to my wife that people will travel to Africa to go on a safari but here we have the deer who, they're just as beautiful and just as interesting to watch. It is a real privilege to have that. <laughs>